Look, I know you know a lot about AI, right? And you know how dangerous it is potentially to humanity and what opportunity is it also. But it could kill us all. I mean, Elon said, first it's going to steal our job and it's going to kill us. And it's, it's probably not hyperbole. It actually, you know, if it follows the laws of biological evolution, which are just the laws of mathematics, that's probably a, a potential endpoint. But we need to make sure it's regulated and it's regulated properly for safety in every country. And that includes Russia and China. We should be putting all the weapons of war aside and sitting down with those guys and say, how are we going to do this? There's much more important things to do. This stuff is going to kill us if we don't figure out how to regulate it. And leadership needs to look down the road at what is the real risk here. And the real risk is that AI will, will you know, enslave us, for one thing. And how about biological weapons? We're now all working on these biological weapons, and we're doing biological weapons from Ebola and, you know, dengue fever, and we're making ethnic bioweapons. Bioweapons that can only kill Russians. Bioweapons that the Chinese are making that, you know, can kill people who don't who don't have Chinese genes. So all of this is now within reach. We're actively doing it and we need to stop it. If you like this video and you want to learn more about me and the movement that we're building, please go to Kennedy24.com. Trying to curb my enthusiasm for this next segment. That's because I'm about to speak to Larry David's TV ex-wife, Cheryl Hines, or as she's known off screen, Mrs. RFK Jr. She's here because her real-life husband could be poised to turn our two-party political system on its head. Cheryl Hines joins me now. She's an Emmy-nominated actress, director, producer, philanthropist, comedian, businesswoman, and wife of presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Cheryl, great to have you here. Curb is famously unscripted. Has that prepared you for the role of being a politician's wife? <laughs> it definitely has helped. I mean, as you can imagine, it, it, it's very unpredictable. Everything that you do day to day on the campaign trail, you don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know, you know, where you're going until you get there. So it's been helpful. What, what would be Cheryl Hines as first lady passion project? Well, I've always been passionate about public schools. So I've done a lot of work in different schools around the country, um, going in and activating the community to get involved in that school. And a lot of times, of course, they don't have the resources, but then if you organize enough people, it's really surprising how many parents come out, even the teachers would come out and paint their classrooms and clean the school and plant flowers and, and get other businesses to partner with them to donate um, computers and things that the school really needs. I mean, there, there are some really underserved schools out there, and I don't think it's fair to our kids. If you like this video and you want to learn more about me and the movement that we're building, please go to Kennedy24.com. I think RFK, as you said, he is now the absolute deciding factor. Uh, we're, how he runs his campaign, who he appeals to, and if he can get more than that, I mean, he's starting now. He's, I mean, basically starting at 19 to 22%, something like that. I cannot understand why this has not gotten more coverage. This is a new national general election poll. So if it's head to head, they've gotten, this is Quinnipiac, they've got Biden and Trump basically tri tied. Biden's got a one point edge. Then you throw RFK Jr. onto the ballot and the Biden lead uh, edges up a bit. Biden 39. Trump 36, Kennedy 22. I mean, that is a lot, guys. That is really, really significant. He could be the most successful third party candidate in, I, I mean, decades, since maybe George Wallace, Ross Perot. I mean, his name would be all the way up there. And then it becomes a very open question of how much is this going to affect? the race. Let me read this direct quote. With minority and younger voters seeming intrigued, Kennedy, for now, enjoys the kind of demographic support his charismatic father and uncles generated decades ago, aka it is disaffected minorities and it is younger voters who usually skew left who are going RFK for now. He also is being financed in terms of contributions by huge numbers of people who have never given politically before, which also makes sense. People who, you know, are responding to his anti-Democrat, anti-Republican message and are activated by that. And that's not only a very difficult 
group to get engaged. It's also a very difficult group to poll. Yes. They the, tend to be the ones that sort of fall out of traditional surveys. You just keep leaning into that anti two-party message. I mean, who knows? We could go triple-triple. Like, if we go 33%, 33%, he's only got, third. he doesn't have, uh, you know, that far away. And then next thing you know, he could be in a head-to-head -head race. But I bet I wasn't making five bucks an hour. I can't remember back that far. <laughs> but the economic I'm, system has become a complete failure for the average person in this country. And yeah. the one person who is running for president right now, who is stating what is necessary, is RFK. And the reason I mention him is, who? is RFK. And the reason I mention him is because oh, he RFK. has been very clear about the fact that Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street are going to mm. own over 60% of the single family homes in this country by the end of the decade, the ability to actually build any type of generational wealth is gonna be completely impossible for a almost universal for, for working people in this country. It is simply gonna go away. Uh, I don't know how much he can be moved on the issue of Israel, but the current poll numbers suggest that this country is ready for something other than the two major parties in this country. Do you think that there's any chance that RFK could potentially be moved on some of these issues and become that trailblazing candidate that we desperately need right now? Well, unfortunately, it was all set up to happen and it, and it got canceled. Uh, RFK called me a couple weeks ago. He was coming to Minnesota and he wanted to meet with me and we were going to spend two days together so that I can get him off of this vaccine bullshit and start getting him to truly campaign on something that could win him the presidency, which ain't vaccines. No. And, and uh, anyway, though, uh, RFK and I were going to meet and unfortunately he called me the day before and said he had a cancellation and a change of plans. So he didn't come to Minnesota yet. But, but let me ask you this. Did you guys ever read the book I wrote called Don't Start the Revolution Without Me? No, I haven't read that one. Well, I think you should. And the <laughs> okay, reason okay. you wait, and the reason you should is this. It was the book I wrote right after getting out of office, and it were I'm traveling to my home off the grid in the Baja. And my wife and I both contributed to this book. And in the end of the book, I wrote all nonfiction until the last chapter. And this was a book I wrote back in 2004 mm -hmm. after leaving office. The last chapter, I wrote fiction. You know what the last chapter was? <laughs> the last chapter. Wait till you hear this. And this is 2004 nearly 20 years ago the last chapter was i team up with rfk jr and we run for president only i'm the president he's the vp and i get assassinated interesting wow and i wrote that yes. book 20 years ago going and, and I'm dick russell my co-writer i said dick i want to do something strange with this book he goes what do you want to do I said the last chapter without telling nobody, I want to write completely fiction. Well, that last chapter, if I look at it today, might not be fiction now. <laughs> if he called only you, only the difference would be RFK would be on the top and I'd be the VP. If he if, if RFK offered you the VP spot, would you take it? I would give it serious consideration, certainly. I won't tell you right now yes or no, because it would it would depend on my personal life. Yeah, and that, and that, that, and that no, and that is the commitment I told you about moments yeah. ago. You know, would I want to commit myself at age 72 for one year of hell? Yes, <laughs> well, and then yes, and then the worst part would be, and then possibly the worst part would be this. Winning. Winning, yeah. and then I'd have to do it for four years. Uh, that's what I said to him. I kept tweeting, and I'm like, "What? What if we win? Like, I don't. First of all, how would you? I don't even know. That, there are not enough showers in a day for me to deal with some of those people. You know what I mean? Like they, that is just. It's amazing. Yeah, but people wait a minute. Job. You got to remember something. Job. Yeah, you got to. You know, we just finished with the president. 
did you who who reminds me greatly of a dear friend of mine who passed away who did a phenomenal film called years in the 70s called the groove tube <laughs> oh you got you guys need to see the groove tube and see richard belzer's portrayal of the president you got, no you got you got donald trump man Richard Belzer did Donald Trump 20 years before Trump was president. Let me explain something to you, Mr. Ventura. I'm going to explain. Uh, listen, this is very important. I, I approached you after you won your governorship, and you totally haven't reciprocated. I asked you for your support. You wouldn't give it back to me. I don't appreciate that. But I'm going to offer you an opportunity of a lifetime. Do not go with RFK. He's a total freaking loser. I am offering you the VP spot on my ticket, and believe me, you're going to want to take it. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Now, you know, I don't think Donnie will be offering me that spot. I could. I I, I, no, I, 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 I did. I did a piece. He would definitely be shitting a brick if RFK made you his VP. Yes. That is well, I, I, I did a thing on Substack where I compared Trump to Manson. That's an interesting comparison. He has that oh, kind of look at it. He has that, that kind of power. They're, they're mm -hmm. very, what he did on January 6th is almost identical to what Manson did on August 8th, 1969, sending his followers out, waiting for him to come back. And here's the scary part. The, the exact same number of deaths the first night. Mm. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Five people died. That's interesting. Very interesting. Oh God, yeah. the, the 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 comparisons are eerie, and I get it on Substack. Pull mm -hmm. it up on Substack and read it. Like we like uh, that's our shameless plug for the afternoon too. Yeah. Don't forget to check out Die First Then Quit, uh, where you can where you can get all these wonderful tidbits from Jesse and myself. And you know, I think I think I think actually, Dad, you brought up an interesting point, and I, and I get the passion of where you guys are coming from in terms of like wanting someone like Jesse or other people to run, and or you know, RFK, Cornell West. But I think there's a, a the element that we're missing here too is is we need youth in office. Yes. You know, we keep falling back to people who are, you know, 69, 72. I mean, what Biden's 105. Well, because the choices you got you know, tie are old. Right. You know, 69's and a, young. And I know. And and <laughs> as as someone who just turned 44, I would love to see more candidates especially for higher office, especially for president, you know, we need youth again because we are dealing with issues today that I think, and no offense, dad, I love you to death, but we are dealing with issues today that we don't need a, a, a baby boomer perspective on anymore. We need a Gen X, a, a millennial perspective on to bring us into the 21st century, uh, namely so we can let the boomers retire. You know, and let them do, you know, let them ride off into the sunset. No, the boomers are going to go kicking and screaming. We're running a hospice in Congress. But <laughs> have you ever, like, have you considered running? Because you're talking about, I know the young people, but believe it or not, when it comes to like politics, your age is the young people. Like, yeah, there's a few really younger outliers, but like, uh, you would definitely be on the, um, you're on the younger end of the spectrum for sure. Like, have you considered and, this? And let me inject something here. You don't want anybody much younger than 44 because there is something called life experience. See, and this is what and, and I would tell people the best age, the best age we could have for a president right now 55. in the 50s. 50s. A 50 year old, someone who's in his mid 50s, because mm -hmm. I, I'm 72 and I can think back. When you're 40, you're not as savvy no. as you are when you get in the mid-50s. Mid-50s, you've just about seen it all. Mm -hmm. There isn't a whole lot that you ain't seen by then. So I would tell you, we need to look for presidents who are... John Kennedy was a rarity. He was mm -hmm. in his 40s. And, and he, but, but it doesn't say that, you know, you know why John Kennedy's our greatest president of all time? Because he stood up to the deep state and got that? No, no, it's simpler. John Kennedy is the greatest president of all time because they allowed him to serve the least. Oh. <laughs> they killed him. They killed him before he had even served one term. Mm. Mm. Shows you how dangerous he was. You yes. Think, though, Ty, I think you would be really great in public office. I mean, like, if you must oh. have considered this. 
uh i you know it's interesting for 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 all my life or a good portion of my life i've spent a lot of time in front of a camera and a lot of time speaking out and things like that I, you know it's a hard ask because you know as as great and amazing as it was seeing what my father was able to accomplish going through those four years of office and governor it's a huge ask to do that, especially for me. I don't particularly like to be in front of the camera. It's not something that I aspire to be. I've never aspired to be that. I've kind of fallen into that with, with aspects of my life and, and things like that. And, and it's great to educate people the way I've been able to have that ability to do uh, and to make people think. Um, it would take the really interesting set of circumstances to, to, for me to run for office, uh, right now. And I, I can't get too deep into it because we're very close and I'll let you know when the time comes, I promise. Uh, but we have some other major things happening in the Venturas right now, uh, that, that don't necessarily have to do with politics. Uh, and, and I will promise to let you guys know when those happen. So after I can get that boulder moved up the hill, then maybe I'll circle back around and think about running for office, but let me just get that boulder. <laughs> up the hill first yes. and trust me <laughs> it's a boulder that's that needs to be moved up that hill and it's going to be a really incredible thing i think when when uh when the time comes for us to announce that so definitely stay tuned for that Absolutely. uh let me throw something to you you're, you're hinting at me to go with the libertarians right mm -hmm. right yeah and i have all the respect in the world for the libertarians but i also have butted heads with them mm. Because I remember the time I was governor and I was giving a speech on transportation and the libertarians started to boo me. Right. So, so I stopped my speech and I looked at them and I said, you don't think the government should be involved in transportation? They all said, no. And I looked at them and said, well, how'd you get here today? Yeah. <laughs> I said, you guys, I, I, I love your libertarian and liberty attitude. But in a civilized society, you st and if, if the society is civilized, you have to have government. Mm -hmm. I said, how could you not with transportation? Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out. If there was any doubt a Robert F. Kennedy Jr. run would shake up the 2024 presidential race, recent polls likely cast away remaining skepticism about the insurgent candidate. He is polling very well among independent voters, with polls revealing he's actually ahead of President Biden and Donald Trump with the bloc, according to several polls. He's performing better than any independent or third-party candidate in a generation. More notably, RFK Jr. is winning over voters under the age of 45, according to polls by The New York Times, Siena College, and Quinnipiac University. The insurgent candidate has proven to be a formidable fundraiser, raking in over $8.5 million in the third quarter, also evidence of his growing support. Should announce as well that Jill Stein uh, has said that her Green Party candidacy is a go. Last week, she's getting in for that race, which will also impact Biden's standing to some degree. Um, so we should talk about that. Jill Stein seeking the Green Party nomination. She was the nominee last time around. Cornell West is no longer in the Green, is spe specifically running for Green Parties, running as an independent. Well, so, Howie Hawkins was the Green Party candidate last time last around, time, but she was uh, 2016, yes. yes. Um, yeah, so because Cornell West is no longer running as the Green, the Green Party has to find an alternative candidate. It is Jill Stein. Um, it seems, frankly, like a strong choice. You can't deny that she has name recognition, in part because she has been um, the punching bag of liberals who uh, refuse to interrogate any uh, of the ways that the Democratic Party's own decision-making caused them to lose in 2016. She instead has been the um, bete noire of the party, and you can see this in coverage. Um, she is being referred to as a, flu f a 
fruit fly mm -hmm. that won't go away. Um, all of the ire from 2016 is still packaged and ready to go uh, at her. But it seems from these polls that the Democratic Party obviously has a much bigger problem here. The problem is that there is actually an appetite for an, any number of non-Democratic candidates or, or non-Democratic establishment candidates, I should say. Some left-leaning people who are running on the Democratic ticket, like Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips. Some people who are running as independents, like Cornel West and Jane Huger. And then you have the, the main story here, which is RFK Jr., who is polling at something like 25 percent, right. a three-way matchup with Donald Trump and Joe Biden, who is doing very well with the very constituency group that tends to augur the outcome of these elections, independents. So we haven't had a poll result this favorable for a independent third-party candidate um, who's actually in the race since Ross Perot, who similarly polled 20-21% um, and then did ultimately end up with 19% of the vote. I was just reading this CNN article to remind me of the exact numbers. Um, so he's joining a pretty, uh, RFK Jr. has already joined a very um, small club of candidates who have polled this well uh, without being Republican or Democrat. Um, you know, if you look at the—I mean, his, his impact right now is, frankly, is to eat into Trump's support a little bit. These polls in the swing states, when you have RFK Jr. not in them, um, Trump is ahead, well ahead. And then when you put RFK Jr. in, he's not ahead in all of them anymore. He's just ahead in a couple. Um, it, uh, it, it, it seems that— I mean, this, this, it's unsurprising. You have both major party nominees, assuming it will be Biden and Trump, incredibly unpopular in their own parties. They're unpopular generally, and their own voters, uh, a substantial block of them, want there to be someone else. A lot of Democrats think Joe Biden is too old and would prefer a different candidate. A um, lot of Trump vote, uh, Republican voters have soured on Trump. Obviously, he also still has a very loud and vocal um, group of people who, you know, we've seen his poll number. There are, in the Republican side, actually alternative candidates, and he's easily crushing them, so I don't mean to <laughs> don't mistake me for saying that the entire GOP is ready to turn on Trump or something like that. That's clearly not happening. But there's enough of an un unpopularity, even for their voters, and then certainly with the general election, that people are interested in another choice. And they're going to have one. They're going to have one. It's RFK Jr. Yeah. I mean, I, it will be interesting to see uh, how Republicans start to respond to RFK Jr. going forward. Oh, you're already more seeing more it. They're it eating. I'm People who were very supportive of him when he was mainly aimed at Joe Biden have have really um, started to remind people of what he said about the NRA in the past, what he said about um, uh, people who uh, he disagrees with on climate change. Um, although you know the, the the history of very non conservative political views that he's had. Mm -hmm. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald pointed out that there is a response coming from the establishment wing of the Republican Party. You have a massive amount of money apparently going to into Nikki Haley's campaign. She's launching a $10 million ad campaign in a bid to overtake Ron DeSantis and present a, uh, an establishment alternative to all of these candidates that seem to be leading right now. And we do see a interest in her coming out of the debates routinely. Um, people polled afterward think that she did very well, are pleasantly surprised by her performance. And there still is an important chunk of the American public, in addition to the overwhelming majority of the um, establishment uh, blob, that very much wants there to be someone who's going to safeguard things like our consistent aid to Israel and other allies over, uh, overseas. Glenn Greenwald says that her announcing this ad campaign is is basically a, a call, a, a bad signal to all of the establishment actors to say, invest in her if you want a return to normal, return to the status quo. Donald Trump, despite being the leading candidate, isn't quite offering that kind of surety mm -hmm. um, to the Republican establishment. What happens, though, when you have multiple people laying claim to this anti-establishment lane, none of whom is doing it perfectly? RFK Jr. has gotten a lot of flack for in seeming to endorse, a, we talked about this last week, uh, some of the college censorship that's been going on. Columbia University last Friday banned two uh, pro-Palestine student group, including Jewish Voices for Peace, the leading Jewish advocacy group that put together that really um, enormous event at Grand Central Station a couple of weeks ago that shut it all down, and subsequently that event uh, at the um, Statue of Liberty. You know, that is such a huge issue in the same way that COVID was a, a mobilizing issue for a lot of his supporters. 
so is uh, so are these free speech issues, and I do wonder how stable his support is going to be as he starts to take more establishment positions that historically candidates have had to take if they want to win the White House. Yeah, Nikki Haley certainly has conventional or establishment um, foreign policy views. You know, if you've watched her speaking for five seconds at any of the debates, that comes across a reminder that she is a a neoconservative. Um, she supports not just continued aid to Israel, but also trying to still trying to win the war in Ukraine. Um, you know, that's her main point of difference with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis. Um, she she does, you know, to her credit, even though I don't, her foreign policy is is not one I, I think Republican voters want at all. It's not one I particularly am enamored with, she does poll um, the best right now against Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. And even in the three-person matchup with RFK Jr. as well, it, it shows her, um, unlike the other Republicans with the president, with RFK Jr. in the mix, she's still winning the election yeah. um, if she were the candidate and it would held today with those three. Yeah. And it, I, back to um, the left side of things, Cornell West, you know, some of the his um, critics were concerned that if he did leave the, Demo uh, the, leave the um, Green Party uh, ticket, he would falter. Uh, the reason being that, unlike RFK Jr., he is not a beneficiary of millions of dollars of um, cash from rich donors. Uh, he got dinged, I think appropriately so, for accepting a relatively modest donation from Harlan Crow, but someone who absolutely is not ideological bedfellows with the kind of people who want to support Cornell West. And if you stay on the Green Party, then you do have much more in the way of already won ballot access in states across the country. Trying to go it alone as an independent without millions and millions of dollars to do the um, signature campaigns that are necessary to get on the ballot in 50 states, it's an incredible uphill battle. Uh, and it's making Jill Stein, in some respects, even if she's a less exciting candidate, simply because she's already run before and doesn't have the kind of broad reach of someone like Cornell West that's been in the public eye for so long, in the eyes of some progressives, is seeming like the surer bet, simply because she's more likely just to be on the ballot. That concern mm -hmm. um, is certainly being shown and felt uh, in the mainstream media as people weigh on in her campaign. I think we have a clip of a conversation about Jill Stein's entrance into the race. Let's take a look. Jill Stein is uh, apparently running as well. She heard Hillary Clinton went back in 2016. You think that's going to be a major setback for Biden? Jill Stein. Um, it's like a fruit fly that you can't get rid of, you know. Um, it could hurt Joe Biden. Now, again, even if she got 1% of the vote, that could also, you know, come against Joe Biden's coalition. The one thing I will say, though, is that with this potential six-person presidential race, we're in unprecedented times at this point. So we've been in unprecedented times with the potential nominee of Donald Trump and having felony convictions. So people are really going to have to figure out how to run races, to talk to voters, to talk to the issues. And even with everything as an uphill battle right now for the Senate for Democrats, after this week, with abortion being a leading issue, I still think there's an opportunity to go and talk to voters and really meet them where they are and Democrats pull it out. What do you think? My concern is that instead of talking about ranked choice voting, which would, of course, eliminate the spoiler effect, the status of Democratic Party insiders, the opinion of Democratic Party insiders seems to be to say the very existence of third party campaigns is a problem. And we want to work to suppress them no matter what. It didn't matter that the Libertarian Party got like three times as many votes as Jill Stein pulling from the right while yeah, Jill Stein pulled from the left. It was 1% versus 4%. It was ridiculous. To, so to the right. extent that you wanted to crush all of these independent parties, it would actually help Republicans have even more of an edge because their independent party is more successful than the left's right. independent right. party. And, but and anyway, the idea that all of the vote, that all of the Jill Stein voters, if not for Jill Stein, are voting for Hillary Clinton or all of the, uh, act, frankly, it's even less clear on the uh, libertarian side mm -hmm. because some of those people would have voted for Donald Trump. Some of them would have voted for, uh, for Hillary Clinton because we're talking about 2016. Some of them would have not voted at all. Some of them would have penciled in Ron Paul, and and yeah. it, it, the idea that just claiming that one entire other coalition would get all those voters, and the same is true of Jill Stein. A lot of those people would yeah. not vote, or they'd write in someone they prefer. So, so it's already incorrect thinking to presume that all of the third-party independent voters 
automatically belong to one of the major two party candidates is such a that's a that's a that's like an ideological concession that I'm not willing to make and you're sure. not willing to make and no one should be willing to make. It's beloved by pundits and pollsters in the mainstream who like, you know, moving the moving the uh, the little the little beans around on the abacus and saying, well, if they got all these, I mean, you know. It's, yeah. it's, it's, they, if they if Hillary them. had gotten uh, 60,000 more um, rural, working class, uh, Bernie-interested voters in Pennsylvania and, uh, and Michigan, uh, she would have been president. But she didn't. Sorry. 88,000 black voters in Wisconsin who came out and voted for Barack Obama in 2012 stayed home and did not choose to vote for Hillary Clinton. Well, Jill Stein made them do that. And that is just one state, right? And those were not, those 88, and her margin of uh, loss in that state was like 20 odd thousand. They were very so afraid of her, so they think had to about stay that. Home that day. Yeah, the blame game is much she was more out there. Uh, appealing than any kind of introspection, it seems. Stick around, we'll have a rising for you after this. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is the most favorably viewed candidate among the White House hopefuls, according to a new Harvard-Harris poll. He's at 47 percent, which is higher than Trump, who's just at 45 percent. DeSantis at 40 percent. Biden all the way down at 39 percent. Hmm. Now, Kennedy recently blasted government-implemented censorship, speaking from his own experience. Here he is talking to the Trinity Broadcast Network. Let's watch. Within 37 hours of President Biden taking the oath of office. The White House was ordering Google, ordering uh, Twitter and Facebook to remove my accounts. They had to, in fact, internally invent a new category. So they have misinformation, disinformation. For me, they used a word called malinformation, and that means misinformation that is true, but is nonetheless inconvenient for the government, and the government wants to be taken down. We've got a little more here from you from RFK Jr. Let's take a listen. What the White House was telling Twitter and Facebook is if you don't censor Kennedy, that we will take away your Section 230 immunity. When the government can silence its critic, it has license for any atrocity. Yeah, that's a pretty significant threat. And yeah, we've we've talked about it on the show a lot, but you know, just for anyone tuning in for the first time or forgetting what Section 230 is, this is the very fundamental statute for social media companies that protects them from liability that the users engage in. So if I were to write a book and I said something defamatory about Brianna Joy Gray, you could sue me and you could sue my, my publisher, Penguin Random House, Simon Schuster, whoever it is. Um, if I write well, something- Well done, Robbie, what in, a book. <laughs> <laughs> my, I, I, my last book was Simon & Schuster, and I can't remember who published my first one. Um, if I wrote something in Reason Magazine that was, uh, that was libelous, you could sue Reason. If I said something defamatory um, on this show, it's, well, because I'm an employee of The Hill, I think you could sue them as well. But you couldn't sue, if you then posted that clip on YouTube, you could sue me, you could sue The Hill, because I work for The Hill. You cannot sue YouTube. Yeah. The speech on the platform unless it's the speech by like a comms person who works for the company. Mm -hmm. The speech is treated as your speech, not the platform speech. Mm -hmm. um, so that is fundamentally important because if it didn't work like that, um, they just it, like the way the whole way social media works would not every be possible. Blog, they every would have to if they could Facebook get sued over it, it would just it would be would be insane. Down. Yeah. So what a lot of politicians on both side of the, sides of the aisle have done is kind of use Section 230, which so it's already exists, it's already out there, and and the court it, it's been robustly defended and protected by the courts. There was at one point there was a Supreme Court decision that like stripped everything else out of the. The, the Communications Act that this was a part of, except Section 230. Um, so what political figures like to do is say, well, if you're not going to adopt policies we like, then we're going to tweak Section 230, or we're going to take it away, and then how, how would you like them apples? Yeah. And everyone from Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, Trump, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, all of them who have various conflicting grievances, right? Because the, the Democrats, broadly speaking, want social media companies to take down more con uh, content, and Republicans want social media companies to take down less content. So 
the, the companies, they're between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. they, they just cannot satisfy both of these demands even if they wanted to. But the, the cudgel, the threat, is doing something to Section 230. Yeah, I think he's completely right to continue to calling that out. I did want to ask you about these poll numbers, though. Let it not go unnoticed that Joe Biden's poll numbers are worse than Ron DeSantis's poll numbers. And how many news stories have you been treated to about how unlikable Ron DeSantis is? Ron DeSantis doesn't know how to smile. Ron DeSantis wears three-inch heels. Ron DeSantis can't get off the woke stuff and that's poisoning his campaign. Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSantis. Yeah. And Joe Biden, who's supposed to be the likable minch of this group, the ice cream loving, dog loving grandpa to America has worse favorability ratings than DeSantis? Yeah, it's not good. And DeSantis theoretically has room to improve because it is, I mean, he's not likely to become the nominee, but if he was to become the nominee, he would start getting more media coverage and he would become you know, better known to American audience. That could hurt his favorability right. numbers, but hurt him. what I'm saying is there's still a mystery zone because frankly, yeah. we're still at the point in this campaign where we're paying attention to it because it's our jobs and you, the informed viewer, are paying attention to it. But there are a lot of people who are busy and are, you know, they tune into politics when the election season heats up and we're actually not there yet. And they, yeah. they, they don't know everybody in the race. They know Joe Biden and they know Donald Trump because those are household names. Everybody knows who they are. Sure. Um, there are some can some of the other candidates are still could be question marks. So there's room to improve. But what Biden is a well, pretty well-known figure at this point. Yep. So who's out there who theoretically doesn't have an opinion on him yet and is, is willing to become yeah. favorably disposed? Much more baked in. And then, of course, the, the headline story here, RFK Jr.'s favorability being so high, despite being either blocked out, blacked out of the press or having nonstop stories about how he's a scary anti-vaxxer whose family doesn't even love him and are writing op-eds disavowing yeah. him, uh, yada, yada, yada. He so, got some of, he got a, one of the most stridently critical news cycles in recent memory, the whole, the, 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 uh, the, the there was anti-Asian or anti-Semitic anti anti comments yep. about the uh, He's the gone through an anti-Semitism cycle. He's gone through an anti-vax cycle. He's gone through a, you know, uh, you abandoned the Democratic Party. I knew you were secretly a Republican cycle. And to still have those kind of favorability numbers, it really does raise some interesting questions about how people are getting their news and whether or not the kind of corporate machine is as effective in poisoning uh, the public against various candidates as it used to be. And also, I, I think, raises some uh, interesting questions about common, commonly accepted belief about the practice of how politicians should carry themselves. One might have said he needs to disavow his anti-vax, whatever you want to characterize them. I don't mean to mischaracterize them, but uh, disavow his beliefs about the COVID vaccine before he runs to become more mainstream. People criticized Nina Turner for her uh, calling Biden half a bowl of SHIT uh, comments and said that that really hurt her in her race in Ohio. I'm increasingly of the mind that sometimes doubling down on the thing that would galvanize a part of the electorate that's become disaffected, setting yourself out from the norm, demonstrating that you're willing to say things that the mainstream, the establishment isn't going to like, demonstrates that you're willing to fight and stick to your convictions. And that's exactly what's drawing people to folks like yes. not just RFK Jr., but Vivek Ramaswamy. And folks who get a little pushback and then back down, you get the worst of both worlds because you're still going to be dogged by those comments that you made. Plus, the people who actually like those comments are going to resent you for not standing by your truth. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it's interesting, you know, we continue to see RFK Jr. Um, having, theoretically, having a big impact on this three-way race. He's polling at a level that um, that independent third-party candidates um, rarely cross the mm -hmm. threshold into the past the 20 percent mark. Um, the last time that happened was, in fact, Ross Perot, who did have a big splash in that election. Um, so we'll, so it you know it remains to be seen, but the fact that he has that favorability rating so high will certainly be an asset to him as he continues to make his case. Yeah, absolutely. And it is worth noting, I got to say, um, that as much as Dean Phillips is getting play, he's being mentioned repeatedly as the candidate, the only candidate that's running against Joe Biden in the Democratic primary. Uh, Marion Williamson is continues to be mm -hmm. the second highest. Um, ranked person in the Democratic primary with 12 percent, um, according to a, a 2024 National Democratic Party poll that came out a few days ago. Dean Phillips was at 4 percent in that poll. I saw Marion Williamson was tw trending today, perhaps in part because she's been tweeting uh, fr frustration about how news reports keep erasing her from the coverage, characterizing Dean Phillips as the only candidate. Um, when someone corrected 
uh, a pundit who had said that about Marianne Williamson, um, the person who said it laughed and said, get serious, be serious, saying, no, 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 it's not just Dean Phillips, it's Marianne Williamson and other people. The response was, get serious. Hmm. And despite all of that, still hanging in as um, the number two person in the Democratic race. So there's still a lot of time left in the schedule, as Joe Biden keeps saying, perhaps desperately, we've got a whole year left. Don't look at my favorabilities. Don't look yep. at my numbers. Don't look at the polling in Michigan. I've got a whole year left. That is also true for some of these up and comers, including RFK Jr., Cornel West, Jill Stein, Marion Williams, whoever it is, who are trying to make a name for themselves. Yeah, maybe Joe Biden needs to get serious. Let's <laughs> actually be reelected. That does it for us for today. Tomorrow on Rising, we have Dr. Jeffrey Sachs joining us to talk about Ukraine, Nord Stream, and some other subjects. You won't want to miss it. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who like to listen while you're on the go, we're now available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Fare thee well. <laughs> Take care. So millions of Americans um, today are struggling to pay off student loans, but almost half of them will never be able to. It's actually morally wrong when you think about it. You shouldn't have to spend your life trying to recover from a debt you incurred when you were 20 years old. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., he's going to work with Congress to abolish uh, interest on new and existing student loans. He's also going to try to ensure student debts are treated the same as other debts. Bobby's going to make sure that trade school debt is given the same protection um, he's proposing for college debt. Those people who want to seek other alternatives and go into trades. I went to college actually. Oh, where you go? I went to Union County. Okay. Mm -hmm. It wasn't for me. Sometimes college is not for everybody. College was never meant for everyone. It was designed for scholars, uh, intellectuals, and now millions graduate with expensive, sometimes worthless degrees end up working in services anyway. America needs plumbers, needs electricians, needs mechanics, needs builders. They are people who make the world go round. America was built with both hands and our minds. And it's time that our country actually honored that. If you like this video and you want to learn more about me and the movement that we're building, please go to Kennedy24.com.